Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I am Nicole Golden. I'm the director of the Youth Prosperity and Security Initiative here at CSIS, uh, run in partnership with the International Youth Foundation. And uh, we're very grateful to have this conversation today. On Wednesday, many of you may know, the State Department released its annual trafficking in persons report. Um, looking at and assessing 188 countries along 11 minimum standards. We'll hear more about um, some of the key points from this year's report from the ambassador. At the launch, Secretary Kerry said the following, when we help countries to prosecute traffickers, we are strengthening the rule of law. When we bring victims out of exploitation, we are helping to create more stable and productive communities. When we stop this crime from happening in the first place, we are preventing the abuse of those who are victimized, as well as the ripple effect that caused damage to our communities into our broader environment and which corrupt our global supply chains. So we all have an interest in stopping this crime. So we know that in every region of the world, trafficking is a major issue. It's a global security threat and a major source of income for organized crime. Um, estimates of the human trafficking industry have reached about 32 billion annually. We'll hear a bit more about that from the ambassador. Uh, so really from a global development and prosperity and security situation, uh, this is a major issue. This is a really important conversation. At the same time, this is very much a youth issue in every way. Um, we're going to talk a bit more about that. But we know about 80% of those enslaved are, are roughly under the age of 24. Um, and the average age for initiation into sexual exploitation, I understand, is around 12. Um, so in every way, this is, it's a youth human rights, it's an issue of youth economic opportunity, of health, of education, um, again, in that broader context. Uh, so to that end, I'm really pleased to have with us today for this very important conversation, um, very honored to have Ambassador Luis Cidabaca. He is the ambassador at large, senior advisor to the secretary and the director of the office to monitor and combat human trafficking at the Department of State. Uh, he was formerly the counsel to the House Committee on the Judiciary uh, for Chairman John Conyers. His portfolio included national security, intelligence, immigration, civil rights, and modern slavery issues. Before that, he had an illustrious and very uh, honored, decorated career at the Department of Justice, uh, where he led investigations and prosecution of cases involving many money laundering, organized crime, smuggling, hate crimes, and human trafficking. So um, indeed, we, we cannot have a, a more distinguished uh, person to have this conversation with today. So thank you, Ambassador, for joining us. And I'm going to start by um, asking you to sort of tell us broadly, your, in your letter, uh, cover letter to the report, you, s you start by saying, sometimes it makes sense to look at the issue by the numbers. So to start us off, can you give us a sense of the scope of where we are on this issue? Well, right now, um, when we're looking at the numbers, they, I think, both shock us and have to goad us into action. Um, there's been some improvement in the numbers, and I'll get to that in a second, but at the same time, it's improvement uh, on uh, a very micro scale. It's like a, you know, an ant standing next to Shaquille O'Neal and saying, hey, I grew a micrometer today. Um, you know, so I think that, that that's something that we have to look at. So what are, what are the numbers we're looking at? The, the best estimates on, on this, and their estimates, um, from, on the one hand, some academics and economists um, at around 27 uh, to 28 million folks uh, living in bondage worldwide, to the International Labor Organization's figures, which uh, indicate about uh, 21, 21.5. Um, from what they did, there's a little bit of difference uh, in no small part because the economists looked at, at some of the traditional practices in South, South Asia, especially bonded labor, uh, debt bondage, et cetera, perhaps a little differently than the ILO does. Um, but we're talking about you know, 20 plus million people. In the report this year, we saw about 47,000 uh, victims having been identified by governments. Now, there are more victims out there that get identified by advocates, by uh, shelter operators, by um, immigrant rights lawyers, you know, et cetera, around the world. Uh, but these 47,000, that's what we can definitely say. These are so much trafficking victims that even governments have said those are trafficking victims. Um, 
Now that's an increase. It's a 10% increase over last year, which was about a 20% increase over the year before. So we do see an upward trend in victim identification. But again, the difference between 42,000 victims identified and 47,000 victims identified, when you put it up against 20 or 27 million people, is still, I think, pretty embarrassing for all of us in government who need to be out there finding these folks. One other thing by the numbers, the 32 billion number, which is a, a pretty well-researched number from the International Labor Organization, comes out of their report in 2009 uh, entitled The Cost of Coercion. In 2009, the International Labor Organization was still, partially because of some stovepipes and, so, and some jurisdictional issues even within the UN system, the International Labor Organization was still looking at human trafficking as the movement of people into the exploitative phase. And so for them, in 2009, they've since changed, but in, to them, there were about 2.4 million trafficked people in the world. They've now looked at their, their interplay between forced labor and trafficking, and now they're saying 20 plus million. But that, three point, that $32 billion in profits to the traffickers was back when the ILO was claiming that there was about a, only a tenth as many trafficked victims in the world as they do now. So it'll be interesting to, to see with the new analysis, the more accurate analysis of the ILO, whether there's then a concomitant increase in that economic effect. I think there probably will be. They need to go crunch the numbers. So I don't want to do the math and say they're in a billion dollars or anything like that right now, but I think it's something that we're going to have to watch that space. That gets to the definitional issue, and, and I apologize for this being the longest answer in the world, uh, Dr. Golden, but the, um, you know, I think it really comes down to this notion of under both the legal instruments to begin with, but then also customary international law. I think it's very clear at this point that when we're talking about human trafficking, we're not talking about moving people. Although the word trafficking has the effect of making people think that. We're talking about all of the activities involved in either reducing someone to or holding them in a condition of compelled service. The president calls it modern slavery. He, in fact, he said, let's just call it what it really is, slavery. And there are a lot of legal texts that, that can be written and a lot of uh, legal arguments that can be had about the minute differences between slavery, involuntary servitude, debt bondage, peonage, slavery-like practices, practices similar to slavery. Now, if you can tell me the difference between slavery-like practices and practices similar to slavery, I'll give you a dollar. Um, <laughs> you can see where this goes. When you start unpeeling that, you realize that the reason that there's so many different ways that people have sliced and diced this is because there's different organizations, often within the international system, or there's different conventions. And so, you know, if you're the 1926 convention, you have to come up with a slightly different term for it than the folks who were dealing with this in 1904, because otherwise, why did you get together to negotiate something new? And so that accretes over the years. But I can't, for the life of me, figure out how to tell the difference when I'm trying to tell a police officer or a social worker, we just rescued this person. Now, instead of figuring out which one of the 12 minute differences that they're dealing with, let's figure out what they need. And I think so, we, we have been a little bit reductionist in saying, you know, all of those, those different legal concepts can go ahead and exist, but we're gonna exist them as though they are indistinguishable. It's kind of like the difference between null and void. You never say something's null or something's void, you say it's null and void. Same thing with human trafficking. Really interesting. So before we unpack that a little bit more, um, for the benefit of, of the audience both here in the room and also online, let's take a, a minute or two to go through some of the notable trends, um, upgrades, if you will, and downgrades um, from, from the report. As, as many of you know, um, countries are assessed and, and placed into, um, well, it's, I don't know if you call it two and a half tiers, but uh, <laughs> there's uh, three tiers and that we call a tier two watch list. Um, but what are some of the notable movements that we've seen? And then we'll sort of unpack some of the issues a little exactly. bit more. Well, there are four tiers with three numbers to go with them. Um, 
this shows how logical <laughs> trafficking <laughs> that world is. Um, tier two watch list, with, which Dr. Golden mentioned, is its own category, but it was really invented as a way to say, literally, watch out, you tier two country. You're about to fall to tier three. We see a negative trend. We see a downward trend, a stagnation. What you're saying you're doing is actually just a promise of future action. So we need to see the results for you to really be on tier two or even eventually tier one. Tier one being the, the, highest. the highest performers. Now, tier one, it's important to realize what tier one is. It's not an A. It is that a country meets the minimum standards under the law. And the minimum standards are pretty, pretty simple. Do you have law against trafficking? Are the penalties commensurate with other serious crimes such as rape, extortion, and kidnapping? Surprisingly, in many countries, or I should say not surpri so surprisingly, because for so many years this was seen as a vice offense, kind of under the rubric of, oh, well, prostitution's been around forever, et cetera. So somebody who has enforced prostitution, as opposed to somebody who'd suffered an extortion, was protected less by the law if you look at the notion of how much their abuser would get in prison time. You know, it was a fine or it was a, a year in prison or something like that, even if there was evidence that the person was being held against their will. So the minimum standard then says, okay, are you punishing this crime, which is a denial of somebody's freedom, are you punishing it commensurate with the other similar crimes like kidnapping, rape, et cetera? Is there victim care? Are there prevention efforts? So those are the minimum standards. And if you satisfy those minimum standards as a country, then you're on tier one. But that's really more like a C if you're looking at the American grading system. We're not talking about tier one countries are doing great. It's tier one countries are minimally adequate. And I think that that's something that we haven't maybe communicated as much as, as, we, as we should because there's some tier one countries out there that, uh, that could improve and that's all of them. And there's some tier one countries out there that who could really improve. And I think that that's a conversation that we're having more and more. A perfect example, if you look at the Korea narrative from last year and the Korea narrative from this year, a lot of really positive engagement on the part of the Korean government. Um, that was in part the Koreans and in part us working with the Koreans, working together with a, a close ally and a solid tier one country, but a tier one country that wasn't really moving forward all that much. Um, and now we see them with a new law, uh, passed, pretty, I think, only two, two abstentions or something. So, you know, those of you who've seen the fist fights on, on YouTube in the Korean Congress will realize that unanimous passage of laws in the Korean Congress is about as rare as it is here. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a consensus that came together around in Korea. And so that notion of tier one countries can improve. But then it all goes all the way down to tier three. Tier three country is a country that, that is found to not be taking significant action against trafficking, um, to not be doing the kind of work uh, that one needs to do. There's, it's not really a bell curve, but it's bell curve-like um, as far as the distribution. And we don't grade on a curve. We look at, at countries against themselves. So what we would expect out of, I'll just belabor the Korea point, what we would expect out of a Korea versus a, a Kiribati, for instance, there's more people on, a, on one city block in Seoul than there is in the entire island uh, chain in Kiribati. Um, but we look then to see, okay, we know that your police officers may, maybe don't, you know, have only finished high school. The level of training for the, for the police officers, the very small police force in that country, is going to be different. So we look at Kiribati against itself, not comparing it against Canada or Korea or others. So I think that that's something, again, that when you're looking at these rankings, it's not a c graded on a curve and it's not an absolute. We're looking for the best Kiribati response in that country that is possible, the best Korean response in that country that's possible, and the best US response that's possible. And so those countries that have the ability to deliver a very robust both social and judicial response to this, we are going to expect them to do more than those countries who are really trying to find their footing on all of these issues. It would be unfair to do so otherwise. Besides Korea, was there anyone this year that 
there was a significant improvement, an upgrade or a downgrade that's sort of notable? Well, you know, I think a lot of the attention this year was around a, a thing that was called the auto downgrade provision. I don't know if Congress ever called it that, but we started calling it that, and so now that's the, the term of art. Basically what happened was that that tier two watch list that I mentioned a minute ago, instead of it being, hey, watch out, you're about to fall to tier three, it became, hey, this is kind of comfortable. I can stay here on the watch list for a while. Don't have to do all that much, not drop into tier three because I'm doing something. And, but I don't really, you know, there's, there was no real consequences for being on the watch list other than vague embarrassment. And I think that Congress started seeing that it was getting too comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think that Congress felt that it was comfortable not only for the, for the foreign countries, but also perhaps for the, the State Department to just have countries on tier two watch list. And so in the 2008 reauthorization, Congress, to deal with what they called the parking lot issue, said a country can only be on the tier two watch list for two consecutive years, and then they either have to improve or go down. And that makes sense when you say, you know, tier two watch list is one of the things that you look at is whether there are assurances of future action. Well, if a country says that they're going to do something, two years seems like a reasonable amount of time for them to do it in. This was the first year that that provision kicked in. There was a couple of years of waivers that a, that a country can get if they have those plans of action, if they budget money, if they you know, make those commitments. And it can be waived, but then you can only do that for two years. This is the year when the clock ran out. And we saw that with six countries. Those countries, Iraq, Azerbaijan, Congo, Russia, China, and Uzbekistan, six. In three of those countries, we actually saw quite a bit of, of movement. We saw the passage of a law in Iraq. We saw the founding of a um, anti-trafficking task force within the Ministry of Interior. Perhaps more importantly, especially since victim identification is the big theme uh, that we're looking at, not only did they find victims and prosecute cases for the first time, they went into their women's prison and they sorted the folks who were already in prison. And they found 16 women who they said, you know, that woman's actually a trafficking victim and brought them out. And so I think that's not only a important policy shift, but maybe even a cultural shift as far as, you know, how one would treat women who have been in this situation. That in some of our NEA countries, we have that issue of you know, the, o the overlaying of both civil law with the countries that have a French or Ottoman tradition with Sharia law and attitudes that don't necessarily have an, an excuse built in for women in prostitution. That woman is seen as an adulteress or that woman is seen as a prostitute, even if it was something that was done to her. So the fact that Iraq, for instance, is now going and retroactively screening some of the women in prison, we thought that was very notable. So too with Azerbaijan doing their first forced labor case uh, in a, a, a economy which we know has a lot of forced labor problems. And Congo Brazzaville which has huge capacity issues. Um, you don't get more than you know 20 miles outside of Brazzaville before you realize that there is kind of the idea of functioning rule of law. If something happens to you, will you be able to, to get justice in the legal system? Um, you might be able to if you're in the capital city, but, but it's certainly in the rest of the country. And yet even there we're seeing police responding to trafficking victims. So those three countries, Azerbaijan, Iraq, and Congo Brazzaville, were raised up to tier two on the merits. The other three countries that were on the auto downgrade, non-waivable list this year, Russia, China, and Uzbekistan, we didn't see that same kind of forward progress. Now, in each of those countries, there are things being done against trafficking, which is why they weren't on tier three in, in previous years. So you can't say that these countries were doing absolutely nothing. It's just that the engine was just kind of ticking over and they were properly at the tier two level, but Congress's frustration was you never see that upward trend. 
They're not in the same situation, though. There's a different context in each of these countries. China has a, a, actually a quite good new action plan that came out. It came out in April, which is right after the report cycle closes. So it's something that we'll look at for next year's report. But for the first time now, in their, in their national plan of action, you have male victims, the possibility that men can be victims of trafficking, the possibility that people who aren't in what's called an official work group could be protected. Because labor laws in China only applied to people in work groups. And work groups is an official term. And if you're in the underground economy, you're not in a work group. And therefore, you're not covered by labor law. So that notion of bringing those people under the protection. So there's things in that Chinese action plan that we actually think over the next year, if they come to fruition and we have results, that we'll see a positive trend clicking into place. Uzbekistan, positive things as far as victim care, especially around sex trafficking victims coming back from Russia. But male victims, nothing. And most importantly, for the cotton harvest, you have a system of state sanctioned, in fact, state demanded forced labor out in the cotton fields to bring in the harvest. And this is something that the other countries in the region have been able to put behind them, Tajikistan, uh, the other uh, Central Asian republics, moving away from state-sponsored uh, forced labor around the cotton harvest. Perversely, what's happened is that there's a better market now for laborers in, in Kazakhstan because it's now free labor instead of state-sponsored cotton harvest. And so Uzbek farmers and Uzbek farm workers are going and getting a good salary to pick the Kazakh cotton, which puts even more pressure on the, on the Uzbek cotton harvest. And so instead of bringing in the monitors from the International Labor Organization to help clean up the cotton harvest, instead of moving away from state-sponsored forced labor, we saw the, Uz the Uzbek government take just some baby steps, saying maybe we'll talk about talking. Well, talk about talking is not the kind of thing that we can credit, because that's those future actions that would keep somebody on tier two watch list. I know this is a lot like listening to a surgeon talk about all the steps of doing a surgery, because the, the watch list analysis is, is something that you have to go through fairly carefully, assessing whether something's real or whether something's just a kind of a promise, whether it's stagnant or moving forward. Russia, just to put a capper on, the, on these six countries, Russia is a country where we've, again, we've seen cases um, done against sex trafficking. We've seen uh, even some uh, forced labor cases. But we've also seen, just in this last year, you know, folks who were rescued from a supermarket in Moscow, Central Asians uh, who'd come with promises of good jobs and a better life, locked in a basement, brought out to work in the supermarket, locked up uh, again at night. Um, and when they were rescued, what happened to them? Deported. Now, this is a supermarket actually ran by a family who one of the other sisters of the family had been prosecuted for doing the same thing about 10 years ago. So they should have been under uh, someone's uh, attention. What's even more incredible is this is a family in which the woman who got prosecuted 10 years ago received a presidential pardon. And so you look at that and, and you say, OK, well, this would have been a perfect case to put this family out of business entirely. And instead, we see it going in the opposite direction. Um, Vietnamese garment factories, uh, you know, there was a, a horrible fire in a garment factory where 14 people died. The remaining workers, rather than being treated as victims, deported as illegal aliens. So we're working with the, the, the Russians. We're talking to the Russians um, about that notion of victim care. There's, as far as we can tell, there's a shelter. It opened, again, kind of after the reporting period. Um, and it's great that they opened a shelter. But that shelter has eight beds. That's eight beds in a country of 130 million people in which the best estimates are maybe as many as a million folks being held in forced labor and forced prostitution. So a long way to go as far as victim care uh, is concerned in Russia. So that's kind of the tour through 
for lack of a better word, the, the auto downgrade countries, Fortuity would have it that it's, again, six countries for next year um, that we're looking at um, that have not been able to improve over the, over the years. Um, and those, there's important countries, uh, you know, that we're dealing with, you know, Chad, Malaysia, Thailand, et cetera. Um, and so, as Secretary Kerry said at the end of the ceremony on Wednesday, and now we're going to start working on next year's report, um, you know, we're reaching out to our counterparts from those countries and all of the countries in the world and figuring out what we're going to do going forward. It's really interesting. And uh, again, for those that are not steeped in this issue, and there are copy, copies of the report here, at the sort of overarching of all of this is the fact that there are penalties for being on tier three, and there are implications for being on tier three, which is what is making the, the auto downgrade, if you will, of tier two such, a, such an issue. But we'll sort of follow up on that um, during, during questions. I want to move from, uh, pick up on something you were just talking mm -hmm. about. When you talked about each of these stories in terms of the profiles of the countries and what's happening within each country, and it's easy to pick up on the complexity within country. So again, going back to when we've talked a little bit about this, um, in, in thinking about this from a, from a youth perspective, and we can think about, again, sort of young people not only as victims, but as perpetrators. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that line is, is even blurred in between from victim to perpetrator, whether that's a force or almost voluntary. So can you talk a little bit about the, those trends and, and, that, as, and the, that dynamic in, in how you see it mm -hmm. and, and some examples? I think one of the things to remember about human trafficking is that it is not as um, clean as we would like it to be. Um, I think that you know, the society would love to, to have human trafficking be the classic you know, kidnapped and locked in a, a basement and brought out occasionally. Um, you know, I think that's a, it's either a Morgan Freeman and Ashley Judd movie or it's a Liam Neeson movie. I mean, you know, it's, it's the kind of things that, that, frankly, when you go back and you see the, the theatrical presentations in the 1880s, it's the same story that people were getting everybody upset about and people cared. And so just as you saw people wanting to do something about what they called in the late 1800s white slave trafficking, and they reduced the stories to, oh, these French men are coming and recruiting British girls to go you know, work as shop, shop girls in Paris, and then they're selling them to Arabs. Um, well, that was the story, but the complexity of the women's lives, there was a backlash in the, in the 1890s when it was found out that a number of those innocent young British women were actually British prostitutes who went to have a different market on the continent. The fact they got sold and mistreated seemed to then kind of bleed out. Fast forward 125 years later and we're in the same situation. We would like to think that everybody who ends up in, in slavery is somebody who was totally pure snatched off the street, et cetera. And the reality is, is that you've, these are people. That's the, actually, I think it's the wonder of this, is that you're talking about people. Um, and our job as governments, then, is to actually let them be people. Not just let them succeed, but also let them make mistakes, let them do all of the amazing things that people can do. But once you start realizing that, then it gets a lot fuzzier than this very black and white, good and evil type of thing. Because there are a, per a certain percentage of the cases where, just as we've seen with, whether it's in the Holocaust or whether it's folks that are you know, following an army because they got kidnapped and then start becoming the girlfriend of the commander or whatever, is that there are survival strategies, there are situations where the profit or the opportunity for advancement outweighs the loyalty to one's fellow victims. You know, all of those things happen. Now, the challenge for a policymaker is how do you then look at that and say, okay, we know that this person was a victim, and now we know that they did some other things, and then how do we credit that? I, I always think about one of my early cases uh, when I was a prosecutor. Um, there was a young man, so when you graduate from deaf school in, 
Mexico, um, you're coming out of a state-supported state cocoon that's basically allowed you to be in the dorms, you're with other deaf people, you're learning how to, how to not only sign but hopefully uh, read and write and, and do other things, and you get out and it's basically they dump you on the street. And the only people that are going to come around are folks who want you to beg or things like that. There's not a deaf education uh, moving up into post-secondary or anything like that. And so for a while, a, there were a couple of, again, young deaf people who were recruiting their fellow classmates, people who were a couple of, of years behind them, to come up to the United States and to beg on the streets of New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles. They'd have pictures of the Statue of Liberty, pictures of, of other classmates skating at, um, at uh, Rockefeller Center around the Christmas tree and all of these things saying, look at the life that you're going to have with us up in, up in New York. Up in New York, there's two apartments with 60 people living in them in Flushings. And if people didn't make their 100 to $120 a day quota on begging, these little trinkets, they'd go out on the subway and they'd have a little thing saying, I'm deaf, please, one dollar. They'd go up and down the, the, the subways. And if they didn't make $100 to $120 a day, they'd get beaten, raped, locked to a radiator with a handcuff, sometimes even uh, shocked with an electric stun gun. And once they finally found, they, two of the guys found a, a deaf American. And Spanish sign and English sign aren't the same, but they were able to fi finally get their point across. And this guy helped them write a note that they took to the police station. And after two years, they finally, I'm not going to say we liberated them. They, they liberated them themselves, but then we were able to help them. Well, we started hearing stories about what one of the guys had done to the others. And early on, we were like, OK, you know, perps, victims. And this guy is 19 years old, Augustine, big guy. The ringleader, who is a very good looking young woman, had started flirting with him and, you know, do, just do this for me and, you know, things like that, um, and started using him as an enforcer. And other people would look and they'd say, well, we knew how powerful they were because when she had Augustine beat up this other guy, that was his best friend. Mm -hmm. And we knew that if she could have Augustine do that, that she could do anything. At the end of the day, we were then, we were prosecuting the case. We're like, okay, we know this guy was one of the enforcers, and yet we've got 56 other victims, three of whom are his siblings, who are coming to us and saying, oh my God, you can't, you know, Augustine's not one of them, Augustine's one of us. And so figuring out how, you know, how do you hold him responsible for holding somebody down while they're electrocuting him? Um, while at the same time recognizing that he's a victim. Now, in the U.S., we have prosecutorial discretion. And we were able to come up with basically a way to, to declare him guilty the amount of time that he'd been serving while we were trying to figure it out. Not much on, on top of that. We even worked with the Mexicans so that he could have the same services when he got home that the victims who wanted to go home would receive because we realized he was in that gray zone. Other countries aren't doing that as well. Now, what we've seen is just this morning, the High Court in Britain, the Lord Chief Justice handed down a ruling on kids that were being enslaved in uh, cannabis grow rooms, um, Vietnamese children, um, where he basically said, yes, there are drug laws here, but these are trafficking victims, and they need to be treated as trafficking victims dealing with the fact that the discretion was not being used by the prosecutor. So I think this is one of those things where we have to be able to figure out not just what are these other laws, but even the trafficking law, what's the difference between a perpetrator and a victim? And I think that the, that the younger the victim, the harder it is for them to necessarily resist the opportunity to, you know, maybe if I become the boss's girlfriend, I don't have to be with 10 men every day. And a clumsy law enforcement response looks at her and says, oh, she's the boss's girlfriend, as opposed to why was being the boss's girlfriend logical for her to do.
which brings us then in, in, in the bigger picture, the complexities that you just hit on it, you know, is it about sort of individual economic uh, insecurity or, you know, at the household level that drives um, someone to either end up being almost a, a willing and then victim or to you know, be, be willing to, to do this work, to be a, a recruiter, a, a pimp, or, or whatever it is. Um, it's a rights issue or a lack of you know, governance, lack thereof, um, function of conflict um, in many countries. So it's very complex. And at the start, one of the things you talked about um, that affects the way that you, you're able to sort of do this work and the challenges of being stovepipe. And as someone you know, that has sort of been engaged on this issue um, directly and indirectly, and, and now having sort of working more directly in the youth space, I see this sort of segmentation, if you will, um, not only in the way of, of policies at the country level, at national level, but also in, in the programmatic approach, um, and even in the movement, um, and in the movements. Um, in that regard, can you talk a little bit about how you think you know, government as well as um, our own government, governments on the ground, NGOs, think tanks, you know, young people, the, the activists can, can help break through these mm -hmm. stovepipes to address some of these complexities. I think the stovepiping issue is, is one of the hardest. And part of it is, is that most of the institutions that we're having to harness to bring into the fight against human trafficking exist. So it's not that we're creating an anti-trafficking apparatus, it's that we're going to the Child Protective Services system who has the thousand things that they have to deal with and we're saying, oh, well, you know, 300 of your thousand things that you have to deal with actually impact human trafficking. Now, if I'm a state Child Protective Services coordinator and the feds come to me and say, hey, no more, no more money for this, but you need to deal with human trafficking. What I'm hearing is, you're taking money away from my foster care system. If I'm a domestic violence shelter provider, and, an extreme, and I've been doing it for 35 years, and I'm you know, worried about how I'm keeping, you know, the, keep putting a new roof on the shelter next year, and, if, and an extremely enthusiastic and perhaps maybe even naive young anti-trafficking activists come, come through my door and says, hey, we need to serve trafficking victims. Or, hey, we need to take some of the, the VOCA money, which is the Victims of Crime Act, we need to take some of the VOCA money and help trafficking victims. I'm suddenly thinking, who are you and why are you trying to take away the money from my issue? Same thing in government. In a, if, and especially when you're talking about both the intelligence and the foreign policy communities where we sharpen our elbows on each other so that when we go out into the rest of the world, we are armed to, to have conflict with other countries. And so that notion of breaking down the stovepipes within the bureaucracies, well, how do you do that then when the very people who are supposed to break down the stovepipes in those bureaucracies have their own stovepipes where the Judiciary Committee and the Homeland Security Committee and the Ed and Labor Committee, and I'm just talking on the House side at this point, yeah. You know, all are looking at this and saying, oh, well, you know, we look at this, you know, as a labor rights issue, or we look at this as, a, as an immigration issue, or we look at this as a dissever. And, and we look at that for our cultural reasons, but we also look at that because Chairman so-and-so doesn't want to cede his jurisdiction on something. So I think that's one of the challenges. Now, we have a secret weapon in the United States, and she's not a secret um, to people as to uh, what she does uh, out in public. But I think a lot of people don't realize how much Samantha Power had to do in bringing that stovepiping to an end uh, in the U.S. government. I think that that was one of the, the, the real signatures of, of the last three years, certainly, of her time at the White House was helping us. Now, I'm the head of the interagency um, by statute, um, but statutes are not self-executing, and you have to go out and you have to bring people together, and we could certainly have meetings, and we did have meetings, and we'd set priorities and we'd work together. But it really was when somebody like Samantha Power who understood this, she'd done reporting on this when she was uh, still at Harvard. Uh, you know, one of the last pieces she wrote on, on The New Yorker was about an anti-trafficking group and the work that they were doing in India. Um, so she was already thinking about this and seeing those stovepipes. I think that she was able to look across government and help us 
on the interagency. And you know, we had a, a pretty well working interagency working group to begin with, and now it's pretty formidable. We went from doing okay to I think doing uh, a very good job in, in bringing everybody together so that now we're in the final stages of, say for instance, a victim services strategy. Um, we've seen over at USAID now uh, a counter trafficking yeah. policy, um, new outreach uh, and training coming in at, at Department of Homeland Security. All of those things. And I'd like to, to think that it's something that I could have pulled off as the head of our interagency, but without Samantha Power, I don't think that, that we would have seen the president coming out and saying, not just this is a foreign policy priority, but saying to trafficking victims at his UN speech last year, we see you. I think that's the kind of thing that hopefully we'll be seeing her be able to take to, up to New York as well. It's a really interesting point. I was at uh, USAID <laughs> when the counter trafficking in persons policy was being drafted and released. And I was working at the time on developing the, the youth and development policy. And colleagues were also at the same time working on the agency's uh, women, um, gender equality policy and gender equality. And there was a very intentional effort to make sure that we were also all talking to each other, even within just from a, a USAID perspective, as well as, of course, in contact with colleagues at the State Department, the White House, and, and so on, because of those issues in the past had been so, um, so segmented. Uh, but I think the results were, were positive. And there is, is it, when you read those three, um, just those three, even side by side, you do see, um, I think, that effort come, come to bear. Um, just um, picking up on this and in the sort of international context, especially because you mentioned you know, Samantha Power, um, I'm, I'm curious, as you probably all well know, um, as you all know, next, uh, in 2015, the Millennium Development Goals are set to expire. And obviously, one of the hottest topics in the development uh, discussions right now is the post-2015 agenda. Last month, uh, the framework of recommendations went forward to the Secretary General, the initial framework of recommendations. And I, quite frankly, was surprised to see not one mention of trafficking of slavery um, as part of the recommendations now. Ending child marriage is incorporated as a suggested target within the gender equality goal. But to me, that is almost somewhat representative on, on a global scale mm -hmm. of some of the, the challenges in bringing, you know, bringing this issue together. Because in some way, they see similarities to sort of, quote, the youth issue in that it's, I call it home full, um, as, as mm -hmm. opposed to homeless. I mean, in some ways, it's everywhere, mm -hmm. um, uh, but nowhere. Now, obviously, you've done a lot of leadership in the State Department. But how do you see that in that bigger picture? I mean, are you surprised yeah. by that lack? That, that missing? Well, you know, there's a whole series of books, and Waldo's in every one of those pictures, yeah. but you have to look for him. And I think that that's the thing. It's like, you know, yeah. we end up seeing, you know, the human trafficking situation through these different lenses. Yeah. What we've seen in a lot of governments is that if it's located in the Ministry of Interior, which usually has more throw weight, and has the discretion not to arrest or to arrest, that something gets done. When it's in the women's ministries, when it's in the development arm, etc., it often gets subsumed to the much larger, or what appears to be much larger, issues, or the issues that get more attention, whether it's through the MDG, whether it's through, through other things. So suddenly, and I'm, you know, when I'm not thinking about trafficking, I'm thinking about those other issues. Um, but, you know, if everybody's going to get together for a big international conference on women and corporate boards, you're dealing with the very top of the pyramid at that point. Um, and then the entire infrastructure starts getting ready for that meeting as opposed to trying to figure out those vulnerable women um, who are getting put into, you know, a prison as opposed to a shelter. And now part of that is because the, a ministry like that doesn't think prisons. They're not fluent in prison. They're not fluent in the difference between illegal alien who's a victim versus undocumented worker who doesn't have a right to be in the country because that's not where they play. And so some, some countries, in fact most countries, where we've been able to instead change the approach 
of the Interior Ministry to start caring more about vulnerable populations, to start caring more about women. They then have the toolkit and they also have the familiarity with the places that trafficking victims end up being abused. And I'm not necessarily just saying the work site or the brothel, but also in the immigration detention, in the, in the courtroom, in places where the victims are not being treated well. Those are places where the Justice Ministry and the Interior Ministry tend to, to be more fluent. Now, what does that mean as far as the UN system is concerned? Well, there's also, even the, one, even the different parts of the UN that want to help on this are often going in different directions because the ILO, the folks in Geneva at the Human Rights Council, the folks in Vienna at the, U, at the uh, Crime Convention, they've all had to be figuring out over the years how do they fit together. And so what happened is, and again, this is one of the reasons why we have slavery-like practices similar to you know, all of these different slicing and dicing, is because the Human Rights Council will pass its thing against this phenomenon. And across the street, the folks over at, uh, at refugees will do theirs. And so bringing that all together, there's a global plan of action that, that's, that's working at the General Assembly level to try to start to bring that together. But I do think you're right, it's a, it's a missed opportunity, not only to think about how it fits into the Millennium Development Goals, but also how do you make it so development is not simply the, the business of the quote unquote soft agencies within a foreign policy apparatus or a domestic policy apparatus, but is also the business of the hard agencies. And in the United States, because of our history of slavery, I think that we do that better than many. And when I say because of our history of slavery, it's because the Justice Department, the federal government, had to enforce anti-slavery laws and hate crimes laws and police brutality laws in the former Confederate states. Because it was the county sheriff who was helping to enslave people through debt bondage up until the Supreme Court case of Pollock v. Williams in 1947. It was the county sheriff who was at least looking the other way, if not actually the head of the local clan in the 60s when we had our lawyers down there during the Mississippi burning years. And so that notion of federal, not just federal programs or federal development work, but federal law enforcement having to enforce civil rights through the coercive power of law enforcement. I think we're very comfortable with that because we had to go through it in a very painful way. I think there's a lot of countries out there that tend to think development, that's those softies. Law enforcement, that's those crusties. And you know, the fact of the matter is, is that you know, there's a, there's a heart that wants to help people, even with the guy who's carrying a gun. We gotta give him a, a chance. And the development folks need to be brought into the notion that bad guys do need to go to jail. So my last question, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, and picking up on what you said about the missed, op it is a missed opportunity. One aspect of that too, I think, is that you know, with the MDGs, you have a call for Data, on, uh, monitor, uh, data in terms of monitoring. And so that sort of leads me to my last question, which I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't bring out, is the role of technology. I know that's um, an area you've done a, a lot of work in um, from how technology can be used as a sort of a tool for, for response, um, for better data, for victim identification. Um, but there are some issues around technology being almost as a tool to, to promote um, trafficking. So if you can just sort of say a few words on where you see technology and then we'll open it up for um, a few minutes of questions. Technology is as it is with every other part of society. I think it's, it's a double-edged sword here. I mean, it's a, a situation where traffickers can not only recruit their victims through the use of modern technology, but, but can actually offer their wares uh, to the public, especially in the situations of sex trafficking more than in labor trafficking. But that notion of, um, just a perf perfect example, there was a case in, in the Netherlands a couple of years ago where you know, there would be kind of a posting saying that you know, certain, certain girls would be coming to your town. 
and you could click on you know who you were interested in and then it would switch over to your mobile application you'd get about an you, there was you know kind of like an outlook um, uh, scheduling thing and it'd switch over to your mobile app and about 40 minutes before your assigned time, it would let you know what hotel you were supposed to go to. And so while prostitution is legal and regulated in certain cities in the Netherlands under certain circumstances, hotel prostitution, and certainly hotel prostitution of enslaved Romanian women, um, is not legal and regulated in the Netherlands. And so what ended up happening is that the Dutch kind of broke into the middle of, of the technology um, and started sending text messages to the customers that came up, you know, text messages will come up even if your phone's not technically on. And it's amazing how many Dutch men's wives uh, read their cell phone messages, evidently. Um, and the Dutch prosecutors specifically decided, you know, we're going to send a message, you know, saying, you know, your phone number has been identified in a human trafficking ring as a potential client. Please call us immediately so that we can help rescue them, <laughs> or, you know, something <laughs> like that. It was very much like, hey, any, any, any wife or girlfriend who reads this, you know, let us know. Um, <laughs> that's, you know, to me, that's, there's like at least four different uses of technology just in that one story. Yeah. It starts off with, I think, a very pernicious use of technology. And I think that especially as we get a generation who's jumping landline, who's jumping even computing, and mobile telephony ends up becoming the, the dominant thing, you know, I think that that bodes both ill and perhaps well. We're now starting to see, you know, the, the US hotline uh, that's um, administered by the Polaris Project uh, with grants from HHS as well as from great support from outside uh, communities is now uh, having uh, not just the phone number, which is 888-3737-888, but also now a text application so that girls who are in that situation who might not be able to actually make that phone, num that phone call can actually do something by text. And we're working with Palantir and with the phone companies and others to be able to then start pinpointing locations in a way that we'd never been able to do before. The other thing that's exciting is the notion of being able to break the information monopoly. One of the things that, that Dr. Golden and I have always talked about is that notion of the trafficking victims are not the, the most vulnerable, they're the spunky ones. They're the ones who are gonna go and try to help their family, that they're gonna go and try to have that better life. And that's what the traffickers pervert, is the, is the gumption that we see with the folks who end up being their victims. But one of the biggest differences between the trafficking victim and the trafficker is the information gap. The trafficking victim knows that there's this place that they think that, that they can make a better life for themselves in America. They've seen movies about America, etc. They don't know how to get to America. The trafficker is like, hey, let's get on the website and we'll apply for the student exchange program. And you know, the trafficker has the information. And then when they get picked up at, the, at Dulles, and I'm talking about a, a, an actual case, when they get picked up at Dulles by the, the trafficker and the trafficker says, oh, we're not going to Virginia Beach to work for the summer as a, as a lifeguard the way that I had told you, you know, there's been some extra charges and, and you know, the way the program works, we're taking you to Detroit and you're gonna be dancing in a club. And so then you have somebody who thought she was coming into a legitimate circumstance here that ends up in a strip club in suburban Detroit. If there's ways to, to change that information differential, at, the, at least after the abuse has started so that the person knows that they can escape and has a way to, like the SMS, then that's great. If there's a way to change the information differential on the front end so that we break the backs of the recruiting aspect of this, then I think we're gonna be on a real track to bring that 27 million number down. So with that, um, we have time for one round of questions. So it's okay, we'll we'll take, do a speed round. We'll do a speed round. We'll take, uh, we'll take three. Uh, the gentleman in the back? We've got a mic coming. Yeah, uh, Alexander Panov, uh, RTVI, Russian Television International. Uh, you talked uh, much about crime. Let's talk about punishment, if you remember Fyodor Dostoevsky. And the question is about sanctions. Under the law, 
Ambassador, could you please uh, make clear for me, uh, starting from next financial year, uh, sanctions against Russia must be imposed or could be imposed, might be imposed. Yeah. And uh, if you watch about history of sanctions, maybe countries which already uh, had sanctions imposed by U.S. government mm -hmm. about on human trafficking, please. Exactly. We'll take uh, two we'll more. We'll do, yeah, we'll stack them up and I'll do them all. Any, uh, any other ones? Um, here up here in the front? Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah let's up, do this. Up here in the front? wondering the best approach to prosecuting recruitment through the internet. Mm -hmm. okay. Time for one and more. I think in pink over here or in the front row? Um, the woman in the Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you were saying that bad guys need to go to jail, but you also brought up the point that many bad guys are victims themselves. Mm -hmm. And how does that factor into your categorizing of tears when you were saying punishment versus victimization and how countries, of course, have to prosecute people for bad actions, whether they're coming from horrendous circumstances or not, and how you take that and factor that into the tier categorization. Let's do one more. We'll do one more. Um, woman in the pink. Hi, Abby Mills, American Federation of Teachers. I wanted to follow up on the last point you were making about kind of closing this information gap and move from the punishment side to the prevention side. And have you seen any best practices, I guess, in terms of education and informing people who could potentially become victims of how to avoid these situations? Okay, I think I'll do them in reverse order. Um, so. First of all, I want to thank AFT um, and the entire uh, federation. The AFL-CIO has been a, a great partner on this, and AFT has been a real strong voice, especially on child labor issues uh, and other things around the world. Um, so one of the answers to that is actually um, that you know, having access to, whether it's unions or less um, structured um, groups of other workers is one of those ways. Um, and it's one of the most important ways, I think. We see that, especially in the factory uh, context. A lot of the abuses that you see out there, um, tragic fires aside, because those happen um, because of a, a spark, uh, et cetera, um, but a lot of the, the horrible situations that you see um, with mass beatings and, and confinement and things like that are because people have done what I would call, for lack of a better word, nascent organizing. It's not a full-on organizing effort within a particular factory, but it's the people standing up and saying something as simple as, we want food. You know, we're stuck in this other country. We came here thinking that we were going to have uh, an opportunity, and you're, you've got you know, two chickens for the rice for 100 of us per week, and we're losing weight. We want to we wanna have something different, and that's when the physical violence, that's when the lockdown, that's when the, the abuse really happens. And so I do think that that notion of more workers' rights, more labor inspectors, more ability to organize, that's a key part of, of what we think of as prevention. But I think that one of the other things is that is realizing that you have to have a, a more individualized and targeted method. One of the only things that countries could, could agree on in the 1904 convention negotiations was that there should be posters put up in waiting rooms for railway systems and steamship lines. That sounds kind of archaic until you realize that 100 years later, one of the only things that most countries can agree on on human trafficking prevention is that there should be posters in airline terminals and railway stations. And if steamships were still the way that we move people, I'm sure they would have agreed on that. What we've heard from folks that are doing the research of escaped victims, especially through the International Organization for Migration, is that there's a surprising amount of, of, of folks who recall having seen something when they were at the airport. Of course, by then they've already borrowed the money to be able to pay that unscrupulous recruiter. There are, they've already told all of their friends, and unfortunately when you're talking about some of those spunky, gumption-filled youth, maybe they didn't tell all their friends quite as humbly as they should have when they were saying, hey, I'm going to America, 
I'm out of here. I'm never going to come back to this one horse town. Well, then how do you go back to that one horse town when you suddenly see this poster that says you might be a trafficking victim? You don't go home and admit that you failed to the people who you just had said, I'm bigger than this little place. And that does happen. We hear that from victim after victim. When we say, well, why, you know, why did you go ahead and get on the plane? They said, well, I couldn't admit that I was so foolish. And I think that we, again, we underestimate those aspects of trafficking mm -hmm. because it's cleaner in our mind to think that there's that guy sitting two rows back with a gun, you know, making sure that the person doesn't run off. Mm -hmm. So what we've seen is that the more targeted work, um, especially some of the things like the BBC uh, program uh, in a number of countries in South Asia, um, the more it can be like soap opera, mm -hmm. like teleplay, things like that, the more that a victim or a potential victim can see themselves in it, but not in that clumsy way. Because what'll happen is they walk by it and they say, oh, well, yeah, we, I saw that poster about that girl in chains, but A, there weren't any chains, and B, I'm smarter than she is. So I think that that's the, the limitation of what passes for preventative work in, in a lot of places. So as far as that kind of differentiating between you know, perpetrator and, and, and uh, victim and everything else, I think one of the things that we look to, and this is basically, it's kind of duress uh, defense um, at its core, is you look to see kind of how much a person was influenced by or had the ability to, say, to, to start to say no. Once somebody starts supervising, once starts, somebody starts supervising without anybody supervising them, once somebody starts profiting from or committing acts of violence against others, they're, they're basically, at that point, they're kind of a graduate. They've left being a victim behind and they've chosen to become a perpetrator. And at that point, we'd look at them and we'd say, okay, that is a perpetrator. What we try to do is, to, is at least in the US uh, prosecution context, is to credit kind of how do they got there. And usually, whether it's by letting them plead guilty to misprision of a felony, which is a misdemeanor offense, um, whether it's, um, you know, something other than the big, the lead offenses, so they'd end up doing less jail time, uh, not charging them at all if we think that they're barely along that journey. But at some point you do have to say, you have to decide not to rape that person. You have to decide not to hold them down while they're being raped. Even at the cost of, you might get hurt, that there are certain lines that you can't cross. Now that's, again, that's very fuzzy. So. When we look at the rankings, we typically will look more at kind of the, the, the status offenses. Are victims being punished for being illegal aliens? Are victims being punished for being prostitutes? Those types of things which a country should know better. There's not a lot of gray area in there. That's where we typically look at when we're looking at the notion of are victims being inappropriately punished for things that they did as a result of being trafficked. The issue of how we prosecute over the internet, I, you know, this is something that's only now really kind of clicking into place. We've just for a few years now have we had the fraud and foreign labor contracting provisions of, of the federal criminal code. And it's only been used a couple of times and typically that's with kind of your bigger, you know, there's a physical recruiting agency in the home country that is doing the lies, that's giving the different, um, the different contract. You know, one of the big things that the unscrupulous recruiters will do is there's a contract that you sign before your wheel's up, and then there's the contract that you get when it's too late. They say, this is the real contract. And then maybe they'll say, oh, well, this is the contract here in America. This is the American contract, not the Bangladeshi contract. And then the people will be looking at it, and they're like, we don't read English. You know, huh? Um, and so I think that that's one of the things that it's, you know, as far as prosecuting it, it kind of ends up still having to be the same analysis, the same elements of the crime, the same type of shoe leather uh, that it takes to, to prosecute any, any particular crime. What we need to do, though, is to make sure that we're following them, not just physically, but we're following them online as well.
And I think that the Internet Crimes Against Children uh, groups uh, and others, uh, both at ICE, Homeland Security Investigations, and at the FBI, give us the capacity to do that. Finally, the, the issue of sanctions. Um, the sanctions uh, are something that we are starting to look at. The President has uh, 90 days after the issuance of the report, so the clock started uh, the other day. Um, and we'll be looking at uh, what is possible um, and what is in the U.S. national interest. Um, I appreciate the way that you asked the question because it's the, is it will be sanctioned, might be sanctioned, could be sanctioned. The reality is, is that because the President will be looking to see what is in the United, the United States national interest, that there, is no, that there is not currently a decision as to will there be sanctions against those countries uh, that are on uh, Tier 2 watch list, the 21 countries on Tier 2 watch, or excuse me, on Tier 3. Sanctions can apply to those. The way the law is written is that the sanctions are supposed to apply and the President can waive them. And so we then look to see what is in the U.S. national interest as far as those, as far as those sanctions. The main types of sanctions contemplated by Congress are foreign assistance, that includes both civilian and military assistance. Um, with foreign assistance then comes, sometimes that's training, sometimes that's direct cash uh, transfers, sometimes that's programming, sometimes that's the international visitors who come to the United States. Um, what we try to do, and even with the countries that we have the, the most uh, uh, tense relationships, is we try to keep the radio uh, open. We try to make sure that there's still the educational and cultural exchanges, that there's still the ability to, to co cooperate on medical and humanitarian things uh, whenever possible. So those, our first stop as we do the sanctions analysis is to try to figure out, okay, where are we with this country on those types of, of things? What programs are there that would be affected by a decision to apply sanctions as opposed to, to waive sanctions? Um, some countries are donor countries themselves, and they don't get money from the United States. Um, and yet we still end up having to go through and look at that. Some countries are, are countries that we do a lot of work with, day in and day out. And I think that you'd mentioned Russia. Russia is a perfect example of that. We're, we're doing law enforcement work together. We're doing uh, work on the military front, whether it's with uh, the proliferation issues or otherwise. And we don't want to have a situation where the very things that we need to work on a country with in order to fix the problem that's been identified is somehow then denied the ability to do so through sanctions. And so, you know, right now the process has, sim has just started. Um, the president will be making a, a determination uh, in the fall, so we can't, you know, speculate as to what may or may not end up happening with sanctions. But I will say that the governing ethos that you can see from the way that the sanctions have, have been applied throughout the years is that we want to have the sanctions uh, under Tier 3 be analyzed in a way that allows us to continue to work with these governments uh, in the shared fight against human trafficking. Ambassador, on that note, I wanted to thank you not only for being here today, but really more importantly for the, the work that you do, um, that you have been doing, and I know that you are committed to keep doing. Thank you all for being here. Um, this is a really important conversation, and I think we only scratched the surface and got started today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.